Okay, so hi everyone. Um, gonna try and send you some information via YouTube here. Um, in thinking about your Cube City project and the things that you guys need to accomplish on that, there's a lot of information that you need to get through. And as I was thinking about it, there's the technical information, which is the perspective and how exactly to calculate the shadows and all that. And that tends to be the stuff that people worry about. But actually, that's about the third or fourth consideration. Um, and so I'm going to back off of that for a second and go back a few steps and talk about things from what I think is actually the beginning, which is before you talk about the perspective, you've got to be talking about the, the artistic side of what you're trying to do. And when you're talking about the artistic side of what you're trying to do, you're talking about, well, how are you controlling the eye? And how are you moving the eye around? What do you want? to do to the viewer? How do you want to move the viewer? And so that discussion always starts off with something like focal points. So, um, and how do you create a focal point? Now, really quickly, I, I came, I created this demo a few years ago when I was teaching Art 50 because for some of these concepts, I think it's, it's often very interesting if you can strip them down to their bare minimum, which in this case, um, you know, First of all, you know, what exactly is a focal point? A focal point is simply a dominant contrast of some type that draws the eye. So with a minimal number of contrasts, you st as long as you have some kind of contrast, you can have a focal point. Um, and if you have tons of contrast, you actually have no focal point because the contrast can balance each other out. So um, anyway, it's just this, that, you know, this is why I say contrast is the meaning of life because it allows you to control your viewer. Um, and it's really what all, everything we're doing is about. Now, there's many different types of contrast. Uh, you know, scale, hue, saturation, value, speed of something moving across the screen, uh, the size of it, the complexity of it. You know, so there's any number of contrasts you can talk about. And um, it really doesn't matter. Some are stronger than others. You know, for instance, um, hue is a lot less important than people think. Uh, value is a lot more important than people think, things like that. Um, you know, so some are stronger than others, but it's the balance of all of them that is what makes it work or not work. So with that in mind, let's start with a very simple discussion. Um, now, what I like about talking about these things is if you look at these sighting recticles or reticles, um, basically a gun sight. You know, this gun sight keeps your eye in the center. How? Because those lines tend to draw it that way. They tend to draw it towards the middle, okay, where there's an intersection. Intersections are more interesting than non-intersections. Now, what's interesting is you would think, okay, if that's true, you would think if we took out the middle, you would think it'd be less interesting, but actually the opposite is the case because now we have a contrast. Now we have a contrast where our brain is wanting to see something there and that keeps our eye there. So, you know, this is what I mean by this. This kind of stuff is endlessly fascinating to me personally as an art teacher um, and as an artist. You know, it's fascinating to me that the absence of the thing could be more attractive than the, than the actual thing. Um, but in this case, I think, you know, it does give you a more powerful effect looking at this second one. Um, now, if you look at the third one, we had a point there, and it's stronger still, because now we've got this anchor sort of in the center that we want to stick to. You know, and if we draw the lines back through the center, notice how the attraction weakens rather than strengthens, because now the impact of that dot is diminished. Now, when you get down to some of these more complex ones, that these do exist. Uh, these are actual all actual gun sites. Um, I think this one's actually a lot less effective because those corners on the square tend to draw us away from the center. And even more so here, the additional complexity of the gaps on the outside, it just makes it a lot busier, a lot less likely. Or there's a lot more things for our eye to get distracted by. As with this one, this one's a lot more complex. Now this next one is actually the one that I think is most effective because it doesn't encourage us to leave the center, and if we do leave the center, we tend to get reflected back inward, and the only thing we can kind of hold on to is that dot in the center. So I think this is actually the most effective of all of them. 
Um, what's interesting is this is actually the newest one that I could find. This is actually the kind of targeting that they use for um, the U.S. Air Force now in their jet fighters. Now, what I would do with my students in the Art 50 classes, then I would send them on to a design, a series of design exercises. And to start off with, I asked them to design, design a rectangle. that had a series of vertical, horizontal, and diagonal lines with a couple of squiggly lines thrown in. And then they were allowed to selectively erase segments in order to create a series of shapes that appeared to overlap and interconnect and things like that. Um, now the goal was to try and create three focal points. Now some were more successful than others, as you'll see in a second here. If you look at this one and you ask yourself, well, where, where does your eye appear to go? I think most people would say, well, their eye appears to go here first, then here or here, one or the other, and then here. So um, the unfortunate thing is this person, it was actually the reverse intention. They wanted you to go here first, and then here, and then here. But, um, but again, in line, it wasn't that successful. Now, uh, in this next one, I think it's pretty clear, you know, we've, we've got this... We've got this shape over here on the left, and then we go up here, and then we go down here. I think that's a pretty clear read. And then with this one also, I think we're drawn here because of the density of it, and then here because it's the second most contrast. And then I think this one is a little bit weak. It's a little bit invisible, but uh, that is where the person wanted us to go, and it is reasonably successful. But anyway, re going on to the next slide, um, once I had the students doing this, then I asked them to drop in values. Now what you're going to find is the values make a dramatic difference. Uh, part of the point of the exercise was to show them that line drawings by themselves are not that powerful in terms of controlling contrast, and that if you include value contrast, that value almost always trumps line. Now what do I mean by that? Well, if you recall this one, the first one was having trouble managing their contrast to get you to look up here first. But now look what happens once they add value to it. It's pretty obvious. <laughs> it's pretty obvious that this is where you're trying to go. Uh, and it's pretty obvious that this is where you're trying to go next and that this is where you're trying to go third. So it's a lot easier to control these things using value. Now additionally, um, well this is great, you know, obviously it starts, you know, um, it starts acting a lot more effectively for us. Um, it's still not a very realistic image. It's not approaching the complexity of painting. And the major reason is it's still graphic. And graphic basically is a way of saying, it's a fancy way of saying flat. Um, now the thing that, if you take anything else from this lecture, one of the things I want you to take from it is that nothing is flat in what we paint. Whenever we're trying to create a realistic image, uh, one of the biggest rookie mistakes of uh, beginning painter can make is to paint everything flat. So always try to paint things with a gradation of some type because gradations are really the secret um, to making things look realistic. Now as an example just look at the dramatic difference between this image and the next image where I mandated that the students replace all these flat tones with, grad with gradient tones. Um, of their own choosing. And notice the difference in effect both in terms of how much more interesting they are to look at and also how much more um, just kind of, com well, I guess just how compelling they are to look at. So take a look. The point is they start feeling like light. They start feeling like a light source is there. And that's, that's significant. So now I'm just going to go through a few more of these. Um, here is the second one by Susie with values and then with gradients. And again, look how much more interesting they are and how they start becoming almost like Art Deco pieces. Now this one you might notice isn't that successful. And the reason is there's too much contrast. There's contrast everywhere. Um, and when you put the same contrast, the same hard edges everywhere, the end result is you get no contrast. You get too much busyness. And you're, it's kind of like those rectangles with those outside edges. You, you don't know quite where to, where to sit as a viewer. Now, here are a few more going from the flat ones. And notice the difference between this flat one and the gradient version. 
what I want you guys to understand is this is the power you have when you're creating an image. And actually, this is the first thing you should be thinking about. Now, you're thinking about your cube cities and how mechanical they are. Well, yes, they are. But when you put light on them, you can control them. You can do anything you want. So you can take a cube city that might look something like this, and you might decide to light it in such a way that you create that. So realize that this is in your power. Now at this moment, I'm realizing some of you guys are probably a little bit confused. Don't worry, all shall be made clear in a second. No, your final designs will not look quite like these. Here's two more that I want to show you, just some really nice final effects. What I want you to notice is, again, just notice how compelling they are to the eye, how they make you want to look, how they're interesting. Uh, that's what we're after from these. This one in particular, I think, real, looks really nice. It has a nice balance of large shapes and small shapes. Now, how do these things apply to real life? So how are we going to get from that to a cube city or to a realistic painting? What I want you to, in these next few examples, I want to show you that you can actually go from this to something realistic quite easily. So take a look. And I'm going to go through these very quickly. Just notice where your eye is falling. And notice that, yeah, there are actually some similarities between how the lighting is working in these and the design is working in these and how they worked in those previous exercises. Those, th those previous things may be exercises, but all of these principles hold true. Now, I'm showing stuff here like pottery and, and in a second here, architecture, because I want you to understand that these principles apply to everything. They aren't just limited to one kind of art. You know, with this, where is your eye going? Well, I think it's pretty obvious, you know, where your eye is going on this one. It's going to that overall arch over the top. Now, that's because he wanted you to go there. Um, it wouldn't go anywhere else. You know, he designed it that way. And that's the point of being an artist. So I'm deliberately showing you guys some things that are... Um, I'm deliberately wanting to show you guys some things that are unusual. You know, something like this by René Lalique is, um, you know, it's still about gradients. It's still about how the, how the values and the light are created and how your eye moves. You know, it can be subtle, like in a Rembrandt, subtle, delicate gradations, more aggressive, like in this Henry Tanner Annunciation picture, which is beautiful, I think, by the way. You know, it can just be elegant, like in this one. If you were from an alien planet and you didn't know what these things represented, they would look very similar to the first ones, I think. Just notice how your eye is controlled. Your eye is controlled by the use of contrast. So what I'm looking for you guys to be doing when you start your Cube City project is the first thing you need to do is you need to think. Here's Steven Spielberg using these exact same principles in two of his movies. And then you have Pixar doing the same thing with Ratatouille. You know, they're getting you to look somewhere, to look at a focal point by the way they've designed the contrast. So when you go to start your Cube City project, what I want you to be thinking about is I want you to be thinking about where do you want our eye to go and then figure out a way to make it go there. And I'm going to show you guys some suggestions for how to do that in the next presentation or I'm going to go over some of the technical ways that you get this done. But this, these are some of the basics. So I hope that helped you guys out a little bit. And you know, next we're going to be getting into lighting logic and kind of the basics of lighting and form. And I'll probably throw in some perspective demos and maybe a Photoshop demo as well at some point. But those are the main things. That, that's really the artistic side of what I want you to be considering. So give it some thought. Take a look at your Cube City and start thinking about this. We'll talk more in a minute.